Hello, and welcome to episode 10 of C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. Once a week, I pick some topic of interest in C++ and dig into it with some live coding. In this episode, I'm going to review some of what we've learned about variadic templates in previous episodes and show maybe some more techniques that you're not familiar with. So in our last episodes on variadic templates, we ended up with some code that we were, you know, looked something like this. So we have a template that can take a type of anything. Don't know how I ended up with .com. That prints something to standard out. And it is, takes a const reference of type T. And yeah, let's print a new line after it. And then we had our variadic template. That could take any number of T's. And this was called, I believe, print impl. And we took any number of T's by const reference. And then we took advantage of this fun little trick here where we use initializer list of integers. And we say we want to print impl of t, and we expand that, but we need to put this in a comma delimited expression, and this needs to be there. So now in our main, we can do something like print low world one, two, three. 5.0 float. And if I got everything correct here, we will include our IO stream header. And we should be able to compile and execute this. Assuming we set the correct standard. There. So we're printing all of our values. Everything works fine. Let's actually change this to something that looks like a floating point value so we can see what we're getting there. All right. So there are two important things to remember. The first is that the order of parameter evaluation for function calls is unspecified by the standard. And indeed, you will see different compilers do it differently. So let's illustrate this really quick. Let's call this function f1 and have it print out just the string f1. And we'll have this one called f2. Actually, we need these to return a value. Also, we'll have return one, return two, and have them both return integers. Okay. All right, this example should work. We will get that. And now we'll change our print statement to print the return value of F1, the return value of F2, and we will compile and execute this. And we can see that F2 is called before F1 in this case. And so that means that the compiler is doing F2 first and then F1. And it's free to rearrange these things. And if we compile with optimizations, we still get the same results. Now, if we compile with Clang instead, 
and now execute, we see that Clang evaluates the parameters left to right, and GCC evaluates them right to left. So this is not something that we can rely on. However, there are two cases where we can rely on the compiler to execute things in the order specified, and we are utilizing both of them here. So what we have is initializer lists are our outermost set of braces is guaranteed to execute things in the order specified, including in a parameter pack expansion, which is what we are doing here, and things that are in a comma delimited sequence using the uh, comma operator here are also guaranteed to be executed in order. So we are guaranteed that print impl of t is executed before this zero. And then the zero is the thing that's actually returned back, which goes into our initializer list, which is essentially a temporary array created on the stack, which is then optimized away by the compiler, and we're casting it to void just to tell the compiler that we have no intention of using the result value, and it all goes away cleanly. So let's move this statement down here after F1 and F2 have already been specified. And actually, let's do it this way. So for the sake of this example, now we are going to say in this uh, brace initializer, we are going to call f1, comma f2, and we're going to compile that. And we see f1 is called before f2, and we're also going to compile it with GCC, and see f1 is called before f2. And then also we can do it like this. And this simply says, execute f1, then execute f2, and return the last value. So we could say int i equals this, and i will be equal to the value 2 at the end of it. So we compile again we, with GCC or with Clang, and we see that we get the same results in every case. Okay. So the, there is actually a third case where the compiler is guaranteed to put things in the order specified, and that is in the case of, well, it's the generic case of a braced initializer list, which can also be used in uniform initializer syntax, but it actually turns out that at the time of making this video, only Clang properly sequences the operations in here. So we can't rely on that, but the two cases that I've shown you, we can rely on. Every compiler does it the same way. So how do we take advantage of this? When we take advantage of it, we're going to call print again with our strings that I should have left in here from a minute ago. Now, how Let's go ahead and add F1 and F2 in here, just for the fun of it. See how things change. So note, when our calling of print here, it's free to rearrange this F1 and F2 calls. But here, when it actually goes to expand these, it's not free to expand them in a different order. So what we want to do is we want to simplify this print and get rid of our print impl altogether. And we can do that because we can put a surprising amount of code inside of these things to be expanded by the compiler. So we can do C out of T and then stream end line and still return our dummy zero back to be stuffed into our initializer list while taking advantage of this braced initializer to get things in the specified order. And we can see everything is executing exactly as we would expect it to. 
I'm going to rearrange these numbers a little bit. Let's say that's 1.1 and 2.2. There. All right. So we're able to remove a significant amount of code. And this can get even crazier. One of our earlier examples from a previous episode, I'm going to clean this up a little bit so it's easier to see what we're specifically looking at, was that we wanted to convert all of these things into a string, a vector of strings. I was inspired to work on this solution because of a response that was posted to my website and the comments. So I do read the comments. If anyone has any, you can post to emptycrate.com. So the question is, what's the most succinct way to create the a vector of strings from our set of values passed in here? And let's include our string stream header. And what we can do is really get crazy here and say in this list we want to first reset the existing string stream object and then we want to let's create our return vector we want to use our string stream object to convert t into a string value and then we want to retvel dot push back the current value and then we want to return our dummy i and we want to expand all that so these three statements have become our parameter pack expansion we reset the string we use the existing string object string stream object and then we push back the created value and we turn this via retval and as always missing headers and we're not printing anything out to the screen yet so let's do that Let's do a ranged for loop here for the values that have been returned from our call to this print function. And we will print it out to standard out. And there, we get all the values expected. So I played with this some more before I made the video, and I did see that this example has one of the lowest loads on the compiler with smallest binaries, and it's also the shortest amount of code to actually write. People who aren't expecting to see this might think it seems a bit goofy and a bit unreadable, perhaps. And arguably, the fact that we're having to do all this stuff inside of an initializer list parameter pack expansion does make it a bit unreadable. If you wanted to, you could do something like this. And maybe this would be considered more readable, more palatable. Um, I don't know. Something to play with. And as always, thanks for watching.